to this afternoon's Executive Office Committee meeting. Um, if I could begin with apologies. Do we have any apologies, Clark? No, no, Chair. Checked up with you earlier. Okay, that's fine. So, no apologies. Few members missing, but hopefully, I know some of them sit on other committees and there may be a bit of an overrun. So, hopefully, they will be able to come and join with us. Um, maybe in terms of item two, if we just move to Chairman's remarks, I think that I would maybe like to comment that as we are the committee uh, that scrutinises legacy issues, that I would comment on the historic decision that was taken yesterday by the coroner's court. Uh, regarding those that were killed in Ballymurphy in 1971. And this was one of the, the most heinous incidents from our past. And the fact that families had to wait 50 years for justice, I think, is a real stain on those in positions of power here for uh, those generations. Um, Mrs Justice Keegan did record that there was a basic inhumanity in the treatment of people in West Belfast at that time. Uh, and those 11 people uh, should not have had their memories stained in the way that it was. And I have to say, and we were discussing this just before, I, I was close to tears yesterday listening to the testaments of the family uh, and how their lives were traumatised as a result of those deaths. We really must continue to seek and deliver for truth uh, and accountability. Uh, and I certainly wish the families and campaigners well uh, with their pursuit going forward. Um, Pat, I know you're a uh, representative in the area. Do you, do you want to maybe add anything to that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything you've just said, Colin. It's been, uh, you know, in many ways, it was a, a great victory for the families. But, I mean, I would say many of them have been re-traumatised by the events of yesterday. But, uh, I mean, I think I have to commend the coroner on the... Uh, and the way she conducted herself and, and, and the very professional way she with the issue. And, I mean, I suppose legacy is, is one of the big issues that we had to deal with. And not many people, you know, outside of Ballamurphy and West Belfast know this, but a year later in Ballamurphy, or in, well, connected to Ballamurphy, Spring Hill is actually part of Ballamurphy. There was what's known as the Spring Hill Massacre, in which five people were killed, and another priest from the same parish was also killed uh, in those shootings, you know. So uh, while, while many people yesterday got the truth, there are plenty of people out there, and it's not just people from Republican areas, from, from Unionist areas as well, uh, who are still waiting on the truth and still waiting on all those legacy issues to be dealt with. Uh, and I mean, I was on the radio this morning and, and asked about the potential of the British government bringing forward uh, a new truth recovery process. I mean, there's a, there's a process there. There's a template there. It's the Stormont House Agreement. The two governments signed up to it with all the main parties. Uh, and, and that should be uh, the, the roadmap for moving ahead. So that's all I have to say anyway. Thanks, Colin. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, okay, members, then if we move on to uh, item three, the draft minutes um, of the meeting that took place uh, last week, the 5th of May, and it's page six of the meeting pack. Are members content with uh, the proceedings and that the minute is correct? Okay, that's grand, thank you. Um, then on terms of matters arising, on page 12 uh, is a note of an informal meeting that took place between myself and the Rosetta Trust on Wednesday, the 5th of May. There are a couple of actions in that, so if you can bear with me just as I work through them. Um, it is that there, the clerk has liaised with the Justice Committee, um, which is content for uh, the committee to pursue matters relating to the redress board. So we could invite groups to give formal evidence to the committee is one recommendation from the meeting uh, that we seek to, del um, to lay a committee motion for the review of the redress board now that we're one year in uh, and that there are some uh, that are very unhappy with the way that the redress board is working. So I think if we maybe lay a motion for a committee motion for the assembly that we could debate that. Uh, that we would seek a meeting with the Secretary of State to discuss 
and the situations for those that are living uh, outside of the jurisdiction, specifically those that are residing within England. Uh, there are already, um, uh, we understand, uh, assistance in place for those in Wales and Scotland, but not in England. So maybe in one of the jaunts that the Secretary of State has over, uh, we could seek a meeting with them just to uh, see if we could get some movement for those people. Um, we could write to the department to ask about the status of the publicity strategy, which uh, I think has been promised but hasn't been delivered. Um, we could also then ask our own research to look at the differences in processes between the UK uh, Ireland further afield because uh, there's been processes in uh, Canada and Australia that we could benchmark to make sure that we're delivering to the highest standard and also maybe to look at the differences in legislation between the HIA and the conflict pensions because there are some uh, there's a sense that some of the mechanisms for example within the victims pensions that is really good practice but in the HIA, there's all these hurdles that people have to overcome in order to be able to access uh, any of the help and assistance. So maybe if we could get um, the research to look uh, and benchmark those alongside each other and we'll work to the highest standard that's available within that. Would members have any comments or would members be happy to accept those as actions? Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I know that the, uh, the the representatives of the various group, groups do tell me that they watch our committee meetings. So um, for any of those members of those groups that are there, we really want to deliver uh, on these because it has been a key uh, piece of work of this committee to try and, and scrutinize and, and to hold accountability uh, in terms of this process. And, and we do that uh, and we'll continue to do so to provide all of the help and the support that we can. Members, on page 14 of the meeting pack is an outline of the discussions and agreements that took place from the committee planning session that was held last week. Uh, would members be happy enough with the uh, suggestions that are contained within there? Okay, and we were all there more or less last week anyway, so I think we were happy then. That's great. Uh, okay, then we can move on to item five and um, we can bring up into the spotlight uh, our first round of guests. Uh, this is for the budget 2021 spending plans. We had asked for an oral briefing from the departmental officials um, and we'd like to welcome to the meeting today. We have Chris Stewart, who is the Deputy Secretary of Policy, Equality and Good Relations and more generally just about everything, I think, within the executive office at the moment. Uh, and we also have Neelia Lloyd, who is the Assistant Secretary uh, within the department as well, and Tara Kennedy, who is an accountant within the same unit. The three of you are very welcome to the meeting today. Um, we will take note out our usual format of passing to yourselves to give us a presentation. And then after that, we can go around for what will be, I am well assured, will be effective questions after doing an effective questioning training session uh, last Wednesday afternoon. So you are our guinea pigs for effective questions, but that will come afterwards. So pass over to yourself, Chris. Thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon, members. Uh, and I think after that warning, I, I anticipate an IT problem as soon as I come to the first difficult question. Um, uh, I should say also, Chair, and despite your very kind remarks, I think my, my colleagues Karen Pearson and Tom Reid would say there's a great deal else happens in, in TEO uh, that I'm not responsible for. Uh, nevertheless, very grateful for the opportunity to attend committee today and provide you with a briefing on our 21-22 expenditure proposals, uh, which I'll outline now, and then we'd be more than happy to uh, take the effective questions that you've warned me about. Uh, members will have received our paper on the final budget, which, which I trust has been useful to you. And I'll draw your attention just to a couple of points of, of detail within that. In terms of the changes from the draft budget to the final budget, there are two of particular significance that we would draw attention to. Firstly, we have been allocated uh, 2.1 million of funding for COVID-19, which is very welcome. And secondly, uh, 12 million has been secured for shared future funding, uh, which I'll pick up again later that this is very good news indeed, uh, although there is one uh, significant caveat to add to it. In terms of seeking to allocate that budget across our spending areas, uh, our strategy has been has a number of components. 
So firstly, of course, we need to address our statutory obligations and meet any contractual obligations that we have. We need to take forward uh, prioritised NDNA actions. We need to protect the budget for the Victims and Survivors Service, minimise the impact on services delivered through our arm's length bodies. And that's because, I think as the members have heard before, it is essentially a flat cash budget. And we also have to minimise the impact on departmental programme budgets. So uh, to achieve that, the expenditure proposals are set out uh, in Table 1 of the paper. And those summarise the plan spend across each of the key budget areas for the core department, the arm's length bodies, and also in a number of important ring-fenced areas. And for our baseline budgets, uh, the, the spending proposals factor in the, the contracted uh, contractual inescapable pressures for both the department and the arm's length bodies and things such as um, pay uplifts uh, and in keeping with the strategy that, that I've just outlined. Within that, the anticipated expenditure on salaries is around £18 million, and that assumes that we will fill a number of our baseline vacancies across the department, and also that we'll fill a number of new and additional posts subject to the availability of staff. And I'm sure members are aware that that's something which is a considerable challenge right across the NICS and all departments at, at the moment. It's actually more difficult to obtain staff than it is to obtain budget. The plan spend for all of the ring-fenced areas uh, is in line with the available budget, and that's currently under review as part of the June monitoring process, which is getting underway. In relation to the Victims Payment Scheme for Permanent Disablement, which is something I know the committee takes a very close interest in, uh, you'll be aware that our expenditure plans include £6.7 million for the implementation of the scheme, with ministers having provided a legal undertaking that the payments themselves will be made to successful applicants, regardless of where the funding comes from. Uh, uh, members will know that uh, discussions with the NIO and Secretary of State on the source of the funding uh, are, are still ongoing. But I would emphasise again a very clear uh, legal undertaking that has been given to the court. The payments will be made irrespective of the source. The COVID funding of £2.1 million provided in the final budget doesn't yet fully address uh, our anticipated funding requirements for this year. And on foot of that, we have recently logged a bid uh, with Department of Finance colleagues for the estimated residual pressure, uh, and we await, await the outcome of that. Uh, and coming back, as I said, I would just to shared future funding. Uh, the final budget had some very good news uh, in it for us, and that £12 million has been made available for 21-22 for the delivery of good relations work. And that allows delivery of the T-Box strategy to continue at its present scale. However, the caveat that I mentioned is that only £6 million, half of that has been uh, provided to us on a recurrent basis. And we, we continue to engage with, with DOF colleagues and the same will happen at the ministerial level uh, to secure the remainder of that funding or have the remainder of that funding also put uh, onto a recurrent basis because that's something that's very important to allow for the stability uh, of, of this uh, sort of work going forward. In terms of uh, capital expenditure, there's a slight overcommitment uh, against our opening budget, uh, and it's expected that that will be enough to allow the department to continue its work uh, on the regeneration of Ebrington site, uh, to provide for the important investment in urban villages, and ensure health and safety works are uh, carried out on the uh, Mays Long Cash Development Corporation site. Chair, the slight overcommitment is nothing to be unduly concerned about. It's just a piece of prudent management uh, by Neela and, and Tara uh, at this stage of, of the year. Uh, it's almost always the right thing to do. Capital projects are inevitably subject to some slippage or reprofiling of expenditure. And without that slight overcommitment at the beginning of the year, there's actually a risk that we would underspend uh, as, as the year goes on. So that's just prudent management. And we will be keeping the budgetary position of the department and its arm's length bodies under very close scrutiny. And we'll take the opportunity presented by June monitoring to further uh, assess our budgetary requirements uh, and will not be slow to bid uh, if the, the need arises. Chair, that's a very quick scamper over the ground and we'd be more than happy to add a bit of light and shade to any of that uh, if members would find it helpful. 
Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Chris, for the presentation. And um, if I can start off, COVID certainly has been a defining moment in our times. And look, it's impacted people on every conceivable level, from people dying to people being bereaved, businesses collapsing, the educational impact, citizens' rights being curtailed. And then with this being Mental Health Week, you're know, reflective too of the mental health implications. But you've mentioned just there that there's no budget allocated to the COVID recovery and the COVID recovery task force. And I think I have to ask, why is this? I mean, we're we're well down the line to being at the stage of exiting uh, and we need to, that money to, to, to come in and be in place. And you've said there that you're still finalising those. What, what, what's causing the delay and when will that money come online? Chair, apologies if I misled you. It's not that there's no budget for this. We have, in fact, 2.1 million uh, budget um, allocated to, to TEO. We don't think that's enough, uh, and we will be bidding, bidding for more. In terms of the task force uh, it, itself, uh, colleagues from that side could, could say a, a bit more about that in, in detail. But in broad terms, the, the task force is intended to be a coordinating mechanism. It's not in itself mm -hmm. intended to be the primary means of expenditure. On, on things like the COVID recovery, but clearly as a cross-departmental exercise, it will shape and influence the expenditure from budgets uh, right across uh, all of the departments in this going ahead. The sorts of core issues that we're directly responsible for in, in TEO, well, one of the most significant is, is around the uh, publicity and information campaigns uh, that have evolved uh, th throughout the pandemic. That's an area of work that came on stream very rapidly, has developed very rapidly. We've had at times to move very quickly and, and put contracts in, in place for that. It's also very difficult to predict. So in, in the year just ended, I think uh, Neil and Tara will keep me right on this, but I think our actual expenditure ended up being significantly less than, than we had thought at, at one stage. Because I'm going to do the, our effective questioning treatment and, and, and actually interrupt. I as much. We're going down a line that I wasn't asking. I can see that there's 2.1 million and that it's been allocated for the hub and for the finance or for the public information campaign. But I can also see that there's 2.3 million that's estimated that hasn't been secured, that is for recovery and task force. And it, that's a discussion between your department and the Department of Finance. So it's that money that I'm asking. Where, where, what is, I can only assume that if it's not been finalized, that the Department of Finance and yourselves have not got that sorted. So I want to, to hear about that and where we are with that getting finalized. Apologies, sir, and I'll, I'll begin on that if I may, and, and perhaps uh, ask Nina to, to, to come in on it. You're right, I mean, the, the discussions are ongoing, uh, and that's likely to be a thing in the context of, of June monitoring, but Nina may be able to add a wee bit more light and shade on that. Yep, thank you, Chris. Um, just to add to that, we had put in a, a, a bigger bid as part of our final budget um, work, and we secured the 2.1 million that Chris has referred to. Um, and so therefore we have a, a, a residual pressure that hasn't yet been met, <laughs> excuse me. So the, the DOF, the Department of Finance have, as Chris referred to a minute ago, recently commissioned exercises across all departments. And we fed into that just last week and we have logged a bid to the Department of Finance colleagues for the residual pressure that we have identified. Um, and that will, when it's honoured, will cover the, the funding that we need for the task force and um, recovery piece of work. Um, and, and I suppose that hopefully helps to answer the member's question. But yeah, then maybe this was the next question is to, on that would be what is that recovery and task force process? What what will what will that money fund? It's Sorry, a no, mixture of things. If I if maybe go on ahead, Christy, if you want to add to it, it's a mixture of things. It's it's things such as a um a behaviour insight team. Um, there will be some um, strategic communications work uh, within that amount. Um, I also understand that there will be some um funding required to um for some staffing within the team and to continue that work and also to support some of the external work that we have uh, been that has been ongoing for a while in the space of the task force and recovery team. Chris, was there anything else you wanted to uh, add to that? Yeah, you know, uh, Chair, we'd, we'd, we'd be happy to come back with some more detail uh, on this if that would, would help members. I do know that the adherence strand of, of the work is, is regarded as particularly significant by, by colleagues uh, mm -hmm. and some uh, research in, into behaviours and how to influence behaviours is seen as a very, uh, a very significant element of this going forward. 
thankfully in the position that we're in now, emerging from um, hopefully the, the worst effects of the pandemic and emerging from lockdown, retaining that progress going forward is going to depend on the effectiveness of that adherence message and getting it very clearly across to people what we need to do to retain uh, the, the, the or stay on the path back back to normality. And I think getting a better insight into what has worked well and what has worked less well over the course of the last year in terms of how we influence that, that, that adherence. Because you, you, you will have heard from time to time, I think the discussion was to where the balance should lie between promoting uh, adherence uh, and uh, in enforcing compliance. But of course, if you enforce compliance through sanction, then it is by definition too late. Uh, the inappropriate behaviour has, has already taken place with all the consequences that that, that might entail. So certainly over the last six months, I've seen the emphasis and the work shift much more towards adherence. Well, look, Chris, if you could provide us just with a wee paper on what that 2.3 million well, was. Well, sure. It'd be very useful because I think going forward, COVID recovery will be critical. If I could just ask another question, then, please, on the... Um, Victims pension. You've said that there's the 6.7 million for the implementation, but there is a figure of 19 million that is yet to be secured. Just without going into the reasons for that, can I ask, um, have you made, is it yourselves that's making the preparation or is it the Department of Finance that's making the preparation for that 19 million not being available from other sources and thus having to be made available from existing uh, sort of sources and you know, is it yourselves or Department of Finance that will lead on that? Uh, we'd, we'd both be involved, Chair, but I think overall the, the lead would be with, with Department of Finance colleagues. Just to put that in a um, slightly, slightly fuller context, uh, two things I think have happened of, of significance since uh, Mark was here previously and, and briefed the committee. Firstly, as members are aware, the legal undertaking has been given to, to the court. Uh, that, that was not done uh, with, without careful thought or, or without uh, an acknowledgement of, of the consequences. Uh, it, it remains the case that TEO alone could not cover uh, the, the cost of, of the payments from its own budget. So what, what will happen uh, when uh, it, it is necessary to do so? Uh, when TEO receives the request from DOJ for the funding to cover uh, the payments, then we will make that request in turn to DOF, which will have to take the difficult decisions that are necessary in terms of where to find it. Uh, and that will include TEO. We won't, we won't be exempt from that. But we, we will, I'm sure, have to find a, a share of that, as will other departments from the Northern Ireland Bloc. That, of course, is on the assumption that we don't get the result that we're all looking for in terms of the ongoing engagement uh, with the NIO and, and the Secretary of State. The other important thing that has happened is that the, the President of the Board has announced the intention that the scheme uh, will open uh, at the end of June, which is very good news and we hope provides a bit of further reassurance to victims uh, that the period of uncertainty is now over and we're moving ahead on this. Uh, and preparations are well underway uh, on that. Mark mentioned last time the Oversight Board, which I now chair. Uh, work is proceeding at pace on that. The scheme will open uh, at the end of June. Uh, the assessments will be made. The payments will come on stream. And we will, uh, later this year, then be making that request to, to, to DOF. Um, the remaining difficulty is, is at that level then where we have to identify where the funding is, is coming from. Uh, but we know what's required there. We know the consequences and those steps will be taken. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to pass to Doug Beatty now and get Doug up into the spotlight to... Um, oh, I'm going to have a look and see if he's there. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're up. You'd, you'd moved up into the spotlight. I was looking for you in the audience there. Okay, Doug, I'll pass over to yourself. So thank you, Chair, uh, and, and Chris, uh, Nelia, thank you very much um, for, for that. Can I just carry on with where Colin was, just on the, the permanent disablement payment scheme, uh, and that 19 million, which you're saying is a shortfall, but will definitely come on, on stream. How, how did you formulate that figure, Chris? Where, where does that come from? You know, uh, I mean, what are we expecting, and who, how many are we expecting to have been through the system and out the other side to receive payments um, before the end of that financial year, because I'm very conscious that it was originally due to come on at the end of March, and they said there'd be no payments would be going out probably before the end of the financial year. Yet we've set 19 million aside, and I would just like to know how we managed to formulate that 19 million figure. 
Thanks, Doug. Um, it is a thing, as, as your question suggests. It's, it's an estimate. Um, we, we can't be certain of this until the scheme actually launches and, and, and comes on stream. You're right, and I think some of the, the, the earlier um, estimates uh, or estimates of, of low or, or no expenditure were based on a recognition that even after the scheme opens, uh, it will take a little bit of time for uh, the, the first um, uh, cases to, to be processed through to, to the point of payment. Uh, I, I know the board is absolutely determined that, that that will be done as expeditiously as, as possible. So this is our prudent estimate, uh, I think, of what, what we might have to spend in uh, the, the, the first year of the scheme. Uh, but I think it continues to be our view that you know years two, three, and four of the scheme where where, where we where we will see much greater levels of expenditure. Uh, I know members already be familiar with the incentives for uh, victims to come forward early and, and to get their their claims lodged early, and that's why we think the first two, three, four years of the scheme will be the the years of greatest expenditure, perhaps most difficult to predict expenditure, and then it should settle down into something more of a, a steady state. Uh, where the financial management uh, task will be that bit, that bit easier and that bit more predictable. But we thought it prudent at this stage to give our, our best estimate, estimate though it is, to DOF colleagues just to allow them to make that advanced preparation. And, and, and thanks for that, Chris. And you're absolutely right, and I have no issue with that whatsoever. I, and I guess in many ways this is for, for the, the, the Department for Justice and the Justice Committee to look at because when you suddenly put up a figure of 19 million and you say, look, this is what we're budgeting for, then you raise an expectation of victims that, uh, you know, it will be coming on stream before the end of this financial year. And I'm really concerned about that. That's not clearly one for yourself, Chris. Please don't think I'm saying it to you. But but I guess it's that wider piece that I just want to register here um, with the committee. But if I, if I then, and I've only got one other question, if I quickly flick on to then to the historical institutional abuse, and you've set aside... Forty-six point two million pounds for this financial year for for dealing with that for the for the monies and the compensation levels and the running of the the address board. Um, could could I ask, um, Chris? Is that based on? Uh, and I don't have the figures in front of me. Is that based on what happened last year, or is it, is it based on how we think it's going to pick up speed this year to 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 create to create that? Because certainly, you know, if you, the chair has raised huge issues. Uh, about you know speeding up the process, which could speed up the cost. So I'm just wondering, is that is that an offset which of it sees an increase, or is it is it just sort of in par with the last the last financial year? It's it's the latter, Doug. Uh, it's 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 based on um, what their address board thinks it, it, it'll be able to do, uh, recognising that it started off at a particular pace, but um, particularly over over recent months, uh, the, the level of activity has has risen quite sharply, uh, which is a, a very good thing and, and very welcome news. Uh, it's a question there. I think I've much done, much still to do, uh, and I know our address board colleagues are working very hard. Uh, to to increase the, the the rate at which they can can process claims, the parallel for both of them is, and your point is a very good one. We absolutely don't want to give victims uh, either under HIA or or, or the, the permanent disablement scheme the wrong impression. Um, so the, the figures are not artificial, and I, would, and I would want to assure you that we're not simply bidding for money that, that we know fine well we're not going to be able to spend. Um, a lot of very hard work is going in to get these systems in one case up and running and the other case moving even more quickly than, than they are at the moment. And these are prudent estimates uh, of, of what we think uh, we will need uh, if, if we can succeed in that. And we're confident that we will. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for that, um, Chris. And, and because we are wanting more redress boards to be able to speed this up, it's making sure that the, the finances are there for it. And I take it, Chris, just in, in finalising, there's no issue with this money if it's not spent being carried over or going into somewhere else as you know as part of a monitoring round. You know, it's not if it's not used, it's not lost, is it? It's no, it's 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 not lost. Um, I, and absolutely, again, I, w I wouldn't want any victim to be under the impression that uh, if there's any sort of delay, that that is somehow a threat to their entitlement. I, absolutely not. Uh, there, there is a clear legal entitlement, uh, and, and the payments will will be made. We need to get the system running as efficiently and effectively as possible, so that those payments are made promptly. Uh, tonight, to whatever extent our our estimates are over generous. Then yes, you know that money would have to be reassigned uh, elsewhere for the purposes of managing expenditure this year, but it wouldn't in any sense be a threat to the entitlement of those who are applying to the schemes.
Yes, Star. Thanks, mate. Uh, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Doug. Okay, we'll bring Pat Sheehan up into the uh, spotlight and get ready for a question. So we'll pass over to Pat. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I just want to touch also on the permanent disablement scheme, and you've already covered a lot of it, Chris. Uh, just in terms of the six point seven million for implementation, could you explain what exactly that's going to be used for? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. In, in, in broad terms, it's for the administration of the scheme as, as opposed to the, the, the actual payments. But if I could look to, to Neela or Tara, maybe just add a wee bit more detail uh, on what that 6.7 comprises. Tara, could you add I'll some more? I'll jump in here and just... Yes. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, um, the 6.7, it, it roughly covers staff costs, IT costs, um, the assessment, um, advertising, uh, board members' costs, accommodation, training, and other costs like that. Okay. Does so that say, answer your it, question, it, Pat? It, it, it's it's not it's not the actual payments. So the payments themselves yeah, is the the nineteen million fare. I, I I understand, and it's it's a it's a considerable sum of money to go into setting up the administration. Uh, I just wonder, could we get some more detail? I'm not necessarily asking for that now, but if you could forward it to the committee at some stage. Certainly, we'd be we're happy to, happy to provide a, a, a breakdown of that. And again, we'd, we'd want to ensure you that it, it's something that we scrutinise very carefully to ensure it represents value for money. Sure, thanks for that. And just uh, on the the nineteen million you referred to, Chris, uh, for those of us who aren't uh, very au fait with the way budgets work and so on, and how the block grant is divvied out up there. Um, Taking the worst case scenario that the NIO doesn't pony up for this scheme, can you explain to us how that uh, funding is going to be found from the Black Grant? Thanks. Yeah, I think if it does turn out to be that situation and, and we're looking for uh, the 19 million, then I think the answer in, in the short term is, is likely to be monitoring rounds. Uh, 19 million is a, a, a very significant sum, uh, and, and I wouldn't want to downplay the, the significance of it. But I suspect uh, in, in this current year, if we have to find 19 million from uh, the Northern Ireland block, uh, then I'd be confident that that can be done, albeit with pain. Um, monitoring rounds are, are important. They're an important mechanism used a number of times during the year to make sure that we get best bang for our buck, best value out of, out of what we have, because underspends inevitably arise uh, in various places across the block, and it's important that we can redistribute those. So whilst you, you should never base uh, delivery of, of something purely on, on uh, achieving success in the monitoring round, they are nevertheless a very important mechanism that all departments will look to. So if it is the case that we have to find that £19 million pounds from monitoring rounds, uh, that means that a lot of other departments' bids in monitoring rounds will not be met. Uh, so there is pain uh, elsewhere across the system uh, on the block uh, because of that. Nevertheless, I would be confident that it, that it can be done. Of, of, of much greater concern, I think, would be the following two to three years where the figures are likely to be much, much higher than that. Uh, and I, I don't think would be within the scope that you could, you could be confident of finding them in monitoring rounds. So that would require uh, the sort of very difficult decisions to be made by the finance minister and the executive that have received quite a bit of airing in the press. Okay, thanks for that. And just finally, uh, how confident are you uh, that payments are going to begin on the target date that has been set? Well, I don't think we have an actual target date for payments yet. Yeah, we certainly have a target date for, for the scheme opening. Uh, I think once that happens, we'll have a better idea of how long it will take to um, uh, process um, each claim. But there is, as I said earlier, there is an oversight board, so there is very careful management of this. There's a great deal of work uh, going on within DOJ and the DOJ project team uh, and Capita who've been uh, procured uh, to, to work with them uh, on that. It is a very challenging timescale and there remains some work to be done. 
but as we sit today, I'm confident that we will be ready to uh, for the scheme to open on, at the end of June. And, and and do you have any rough idea about when you would expect the payments to start flowing? I don't, and it would probably be unhelpful if I speculated on that today, but happy to go back to DOJ colleagues uh, and indeed the board itself and ask for an estimate of that. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Pat. We'll bring uh, Trevor Lunn up into the uh, spotlight and get a question from yourself, please, Trevor. Okay, Chair, thanks very much. I'm sorry I was late to call in today. Uh, hello, Chris. Um, I see the amount on the uh, capital expenditure for Mays Law and Cash Development Corporation, 1.3 million. Is, is that just for basic infrastructure or is it uh, an improvement to what's already there or is it perhaps the prospect of new tenants moving onto the site? If you have any clue for me as to what, what's actually going to be spent on? Again, uh, thank you, Trevor. Again, I, I'll start and perhaps ask colleagues to add a wee bit more, more detail if, if they can. It's not major development of, of the site. Uh, as you know, there isn't yet agreement uh, for, for that to go forward. So it's largely in terms, I think, of health and safety maintenance or uh, development or preservation of, of the site rather than significant new development. Yeah, Chris, just to add to that, that that's that's exactly um that captures it succinctly as to what the, the capital budget of one point three million is planned to be spent on in, in the coming year, just as you say, restoration work um to some of the existing buildings, etc. Work to the structures on the fabric of the listed and the retained buildings and then some site wide security and health and safety works meet obligations for the existing tenants. That that's okay. that's basically the plan at this stage. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. It's probably not a fair question for you guys, but um, if uh, I know there's not much agreement about what to do with this site, all 300 acres of it, but if, if a new tenant applied to come onto the site at the moment, was there any prospect they would be allowed to? Uh, I think, Trevor, the only answer I could give to that is that that is very much a political question. Uh, and the answer would be the same as we've given on previous occasions. Uh, further development of the site would require political agreement. All right. Thanks very much. Thank uh, you. And by the way, it's 360 acres. Yeah, I forgot about that 60 years <laughs> outside of a golf course. It's, it's burnt into my memory from 20 years ago. I know. Same here. Thanks very much. I know that your, your basic unit of measurement is a golf course that you work everything out. Uh, that's a golf course. That's half a golf course. That could be two golf courses. That's very good. Very good. Okay. Look, next up is uh, Martina Anderson. So we'll bring Martina up into the spotlight and get a question from Martina. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you all. And thank you for the information you sent beforehand. Can I ask about historical institutional abuse? Because whatever the victim or the figures that we have in front of us today, as you know, the, the victims and survivors are not satisfied with the current levels of award. So what's the department doing about that? Thanks, Martina. Um... I met with the, the president of the redress board actually just, just yesterday and have had, had meetings with, with Kosica, the, the commissioner uh, as well. One of the things I think we're all conscious of, you know, there's, there's an important tripartite relationship there between ourselves and the department, the redress board and, and the commissioner. Uh, and we all need to be orientated towards uh, addressing the needs of, of victims. So we are looking at the moment to see um, what needs to be done in terms of improving the overall end-to-end -end experience of, of victims through, throughout all of this. And that's everything from what the commissioner uh, does, uh, how the address board goes about its, its, its business, and right through for us in terms of, of any policy or legislation questions that, that might arise. And clearly, as, as part of that, we need to engage with victims and the victims' organizations themselves, and of course, with the commissioner to, to see what can be done there. So, uh, you know, I think the, the short answer to that is it's an ongoing process process. It's absolutely not the case that, that we think that this, this system is, is beyond improvement and we need to constantly and consistently engage with, with victims to see where and how we can improve it. Well, I'm glad to hear that it's not going to be Chris business as usual and that you are actually listening and as you say uh, that you will t make improvements where you can so that the victims and survivors can not just be heard but that they can see a process being put in place and um, that there's somewhat a bit of redress to the process that they feel is not adequately addressing their needs. Glad to hear, I think, as we all were, about the 12 million for TBUC. And Chris, 
uh, I've been raising this with officials, uh, your, your officials and also officials in the Department for Justice. And it's an area in Derry around Gallia and Skeg. And it was in the context of the urban villages and the need to uh, ensure that we create um, and seriously look at expanding the geographical area that urban villages are, are dealing with and the communities in transition as well uh, and adding sort of community capacity and just creating sustainability and interventions for young people just to tackle the whole area of deprivation. You know, we've had a number of PSNI ball mornings, riots, bonfires, anti-peace process elements becoming very active around uh, around those areas. And yet we see, for instance, in this city that the urban villages does not extend to affording, for instance, those community groups who are doing sterling work um, in those areas to try to deal with the pressures that they are under. So whatever about the money that has been allocated, what's the kind of thinking is going in to expand urban villages and communities in transition? I think that's a very important question. Martina, the short answer is we'd like to expand both of them. Uh, and, and I think there are a number of, of, of dimensions there. I think both of those programs or projects have been extremely successful. I can't claim any credit for it whatsoever. It's all the work of my predecessor uh, and, and the existing team. But I think one of the real strengths of both of those has been that they are community-centered and, and community-led. They're not top-down things that are, that are imposed or dropped onto communities, but there's a very real process of, of co-design and delivery there uh, that has uh, worked very, very successfully. So we are, uh, at the moment, I mean, for, for communities in transition, we're just at the point of moving into the second phase. Uh, so, you know, the, the early discussions on uh, on that and the early engagements are, are, are taking place. But I think for, for both of them, I think we want to build on the success of that area-based approach, uh, and w which naturally lends itself to, to, to joining up joint delivery with colleagues in justice, with colleagues in, in, in communities, to see if we can expand that. Uh, I mean, it's called urban villages because, of course, that's where it started and that's where, where its focus was. But, you know, what about rural villages? What about other types of villages, other types of, of community? There is surely good practice there that, that we can extend to, to, to other areas. And we want to explore the, the scope of that as well. Likewise, communities in, in, in transition, uh, not always well understood. Uh, and we were, uh, frankly, dismayed by some of the media coverage uh, in recent weeks. Uh, over the announcement of, of, of the funding uh, uh, around that. Uh, the value, I think, of, of that program is that it is, as I say, community-led. It resulted from a very protracted, but rightly so, period of engagement with communities about what they needed to build on that capacity and help them uh, on the transition journey. Uh, that isn't one size fits all. It's not the same answer in, in every community. And again, that's the strength of, of the program and that it, that it has that flexibility. I can sum all of that up by saying we, we want to expand and, and develop both of those, recognizing that you need different solutions in, in different places. A lot of that depends on, on budget. So we're very glad to get the, the £12 million pounds for, for a shared future. We would like that to be mainstreamed. We're very glad to have the £10 million pounds for, for communities in transition and particularly welcome the fact that that's over three years. Uh, no other part of the Tackling Paramilitarism program managed to get three-year funding. So, uh, you know, we count ourselves fortunate in, in that regard. But I think the, the, the caveat that I would put on, on that is that this is difficult work. It's asking communities to do difficult things. It's asking organizations and, and leaders within communities to do difficult things, sometimes at risk. And it's important that we demonstrate our, our good faith and our willingness to invest in communities and work with them. And the obvious manifestation of that is the money being there on a recurrent basis. It's much, much more difficult to ask people to take risks on the back of a one-year funding offer than it is on the back of a recurrent funding offer. So we very much want to um, consolidate the progress we've made in, in, in both of those, those programs, roll them out a bit further, and demonstrate our confidence in those communities and our willingness to invest in them. Um, Chair, I think this is something that as a committee we need to uh, explore further. I concur with all that Chris is saying, but my concern is that it falls between two stools. 
and we end up ping ponging, you know, between your the, the the TEO and the Department for Justice. And so, what Chris is saying about trying to make sure that we get a coordinated approach into these areas, but we also need a lead. And we need to know who is the lead because I have found myself just going from pillar to post. And that's not good for any representative is that when the community is crying out for help. Um, unfortunately, Chris, what you said in relation to communities in translation, uh, transition and some of the reports, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Um, as I said, because people who's on the ground know the impact that those programs are having in those areas. But what I would say to you, and I'm sure that my area is no different than any other, and I say this in terms of Galia and Skag, you know, you get end to spend money, you know, thrown at them at the end for the, to try to cobble together a program. That is not a good way of doing business. So I can I know, understand what you're saying about budget, um, but we need to be identifying and showing the areas that they're on the list um, and it's not just, they're not like routine sympathy. We have got problems. There are problems in this area and this is the program and the projects that can actually help. So Chair, I think we need to just come back to, to this uh, in the time ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Martina. And uh, I can lend my experience as sort of 16 years as a full-time youth worker to say that falling between two stools is not a good place to play ping pong. Uh, you always end up getting well hurt in there. That's my little uh, help for today. I I'm going to invite up our next question uh, from Emma Sheeran. If we could get a question from Emma. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the presenters this afternoon again. I just wanted to ask around the funding that's been set there for the dedicated mechanism. I noticed that it's 800,000. Obviously, this is one of the integral S aspects of the, the protocol and under the Article 2, um, the implementation of the, the Human Rights and Equality Commission's sort of strategy to protect rights post-Brexit and obviously as we have moved out of the EU we've seen the loss of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and obviously we won't be keeping pace with any um, directives that the EU apply from, from here on out which is obviously as time goes on is going to leave us in the situation where people in the North are at a rights deficit compared with um, anybody that's in the 26 counties, particularly those who carry an Irish passport and are still technically EU citizens so I just wanted to, to get a bit of an explanation on that because it seems like that might be quite a small budget given um, the, the remit that the dedicated mechanism has? It's, it's, a, it's a fair observation. Um, I, colleagues may want to, to add to this. I, I haven't had any specific representation made uh, to, to me from, from the Commission about, about the size of it, but certainly it's, it's an important role. You're absolutely right. Uh, and if at any stage the Commission uh, felt that um, the mechanism itself was in danger of being ineffective because, because the budget isn't sufficient, then that's, that's absolutely something that we would want to look at. Thank you very much, then, Emma. Okay. Um, then uh, we have brought George up into the spotlight there. Can I just confirm with George Robinson, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask if you're there? No, uh, no, okay, I don't think we have George there. Okay, so look, um, folks, we have um, no other questions indicated there, and I think uh, around about 45 minutes for the session, I think our effective questioning session went very well last week to contain that in, in that time. So thank you very much indeed for your uh, presentation and attendance at the committee today. I do know that there's a couple of bits of information that you're going to come back to us with, and uh, we will certainly maybe schedule some more briefings going forward just on some of the issues that have been raised, raised as well. But thank you very much for your attendance today. Thank you, Chair. I'd be happy to follow that up and happy to assure you that you got good value for money out of the course. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, uh, members, can I maybe can I just check with you there, um, Michael? Do you, have you captured there um, what Martina was suggesting about getting um, the presentation on, on on those other programs? Yeah, yes, Chair, I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, 
our next session is actually due, due at three o'clock. So I'm just going to double check. Do we have? But members, a few of our other uh, those attending haven't aren't quite there. We have a few minutes. I'll maybe suggest if we maybe move to correspondence. Um, if that suited members, we could maybe the correspondence and forward work program, and we could maybe try and do that in a few minutes, and then that will be. So it's actually just uh, item eight that you want to move to, uh, which is the forward meet, uh, work program, just to let members know that the Committee of Finance is content that the committee receives an oral briefing from the SEUPB on the Peace Plus consultation uh, instead of that, their committee, the Finance Committee. So would members be happy enough if we write to the SEUPB and invite them to brief the committee on the 26th of May? Content, Jack. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Content there. Uh, outside of that, are members happy enough to, to note the forward work program? Content. Uh, Chair, just in terms of one area of correspondence, sorry, before you move off it, um, and it's only to note it's something that we've been talking about around the transfer functions order. It's on page 227, um, and it's from the Committee of Infrastructure, of which I'm also a member, and it's it's about the reservoir issue. So if they're just to ask the committee just to accelerate that, please, if possible, there's no issues with it. We just need it done. Okay. Uh, you're 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 powering ahead of me today, Martina. We haven't even got to the correspondence yet, but we'll know certainly. We'll take so sorry. Um, so we, I mean, we really are going well today. We're going very fast, very fast. But look, folks, at item nine, then correspondence. There's nine uh, items on the pack there, and we'll take Martina's. Uh, suggesting about going as fast as we can with item 9.2. Um, of the other items, just to raise um, that there was correspondence that had come in that has been forwarded and th that the Committee for Justice uh, to ourselves about the executive wide violence against women and girls strategy. The responsibility for coordinating this strategy will lie uh, with the executive office and therefore the scrutiny of that work uh, will be carried out by ourselves. Maybe on the back of that, would members be content if we scheduled an oral briefing from the uh, relevant departmental officials just to find out where they're, where they're going with that and where, uh, what sort of work they'll be undertaking? So are members happy enough if we schedule that? Oh. Yeah. Then item 9.7 is correspondence relating to the laying of the Public Services Ombudsman Act, Northern Ireland 2016 Commencement Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Uh, as a formality, just that uh, will be uh, included in next week's uh, or papers. I, I don't think we're required to do that because it, it sits just alongside our procedures rather than part of them, but we're going to table it for next week so that it's there um, and we can treat it as we would any other uh, statutory instrument that would come through. So that's really just uh, the feedback has come in on that, but we will be tabling that next week. Are members content to note the rest of the correspondence or is there any other items that people would like to raise? Okay, so if we're happy enough then to move, uh, I can see that we have two of the three presenters. So we maybe just could move on to that. And if we could ask for, uh, we, I see that Emma Dello Perry is there from the research office, and Aidan Stennett is also there. If we could invite the two of them up on board to the spotlight and. Um, if we could then maybe, if we wanted to drop maybe the members down in the audience and that will enable me to see our two guests. There we go. And you're both very welcome. Are we expecting Eileen as well or is, is she, we're not, she's not, okay. So it's yourselves then. So uh, what we can do then is we'll pass over to yourselves and you can provide us with the uh, input that you have. And then afterwards we can open it up for some effective questioning. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, Chair, and, and good afternoon, Committee. Um, today, Emma and I are going to speak to you about the paper um, 
we have prepared on uh, potential expert witnesses who may be able to assist the committee with their scrutiny of the um, of the protocol. So, just to uh, uh, the, the members may uh, recall that uh, this is a, a piece of work that was jointly commissioned with the um, committee for finance, which explains the, the references to that committee throughout the paper. Sorry. Um, um, and can I just interrupt you there? My apologies. Myself, it was my fault for not checking that we've gone into, uh, we, we've moved off public session. And we're in Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Shana. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay. I'm conscious that we're back into public session again, and uh, we were going to move on to the next part, but I note that we don't have Shauna with us at this stage, so hopefully Shauna can get online, um, because we are running a little bit early, and uh, I can... If members could just bear with me for a couple of minutes, what I might do, I'm just checking the time. We suggest that it's now only uh, 20 past. Could I suggest, I don't know if Sean is there, I can see she's joined us. So we'll get her up into the spotlight and then we will be able to progress then to item seven of the meeting today, which is the UK exit from EU, the Assembly EU Affairs Manager. Uh, the UK matters, uh, EU matters update. The papers are on page 143 to 149 of the meeting pack. Um, with Shauna there, what we can do is welcome Shauna to the meeting and we can pass over to yourself, Shauna, to give us a bit of an update on things that have happened uh, in the past period. And then if members have questions, we can move to that. So you're very welcome and it's over to yourself. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, okay, well, I'll just um, very briefly run through the paper and then, as you say, Chair, very happy to take questions from members. 
Um, so really just um, I wanted to give an update on the latest position in respect to the various structures under the withdrawal agreement. Um, so uh, since I was last at the, at the committee, the most recent meeting of the Joint Committee took place at the end of February. Um, and that was the first meeting that um, the EU and UK Joint Committee had had since the end of the transition period. Um, and there was a joint statement issued after that meeting um, where both sides welcomed the progress made on citizens' rights. Um, and they also um, took stock of the implementation on the protocol uh, and acknowledged the importance of joint action to make the protocol work. And they reiterated their commitment to the Good Friday Agreement and underlined their shared commitment to giving effect to the solutions they had already agreed in December 2020. Um, and they agreed that they would uh, continue their ongoing engagement. Um, at the end of March, then the UK delivered what they called a work programme to the European Commission which outlined its views on the implementation of the protocol. And this really follows on the back of the government's uh, unilateral action in March in respect of extending the grace periods. Um, in response to that unilateral action, the European Commission had requested that the UK provide uh, a credible roadmap with clear deliverables and milestones for the implementation of the rules and requirements of the protocol. Um, and this work programme that the UK government provided was the government's response to that request from the Commission. So the co-chairs of the Joint Committee, Lord Frost and Maros Shevkovic, met on the 15th of April um, and had intensive discussions uh, in respect of the protocol and were working to clarify a number of outstanding uh, issues. And they said that positive momentum had been established, but that a number of difficult issues remain and there should be intensified contacts at all levels in the coming weeks. Um, Lord Frost reiterated the UK's commitment to working through the withdrawal agreement bodies and he said that any solutions have to be consistent with the Good Friday Agreement and ensure minimum disruption of everybody's lives in Northern Ireland. And the Commission's statement following that meeting said that uh, the meeting was constructive and held in a solution-driven driven atmosphere and that the teams were given a political steer for technical level discussions, which would intensify over the coming weeks. Maros Shevkovic insisted that mutually agreed paths towards compliance are key for the full implementation of the protocol. Uh, and stated that the implementation of the protocol is very much a joint endeavour which leaves no space for unilateral action. Um, he also mentioned the legal action that the EU is taking against the UK in respect of these unilateral actions, um, and he said that it will continue as long as necessary. Um, the pair agreed to engage further with business groups and civil society in Northern Ireland or, uh, over the coming weeks. Um, also, in respect of the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee, just worth pointing out that the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee has published a report on the Joint Committee, um, really focusing on how that can be effectively scrutinised, um, particularly in relation to the protocol. And that committee's report was published on the 9th of April. Um, and it says that uh, information provided by the Government to Parliament about the decisions of the Joint Committee have been incomplete and made available too late. Um, meaning that democratic scrutiny has not been possible. The committee calls on the government to provide greater transparency around the joint committee meetings, including publishing minutes of meetings and detailed agendas. Simon Coveney also gave evidence to the Oireachtas Joint Committee and EU Fires on the Protocol uh, on the 27th of April, and he uh, again reiterated about uh, technical negotiations that were taking place, seemingly to echo Maris Shevkovic's comments about ongoing technical discussions. He said that um, discussions between the UK and the EU on the protocol relate to around 26 issues, 20 of which could be resolved through technical negotiation and a further six which are more political and more difficult to deal with. Um, these issues include SBS arrangements, steel, tariffs, supplies of medicine and country of origin rules. Um, the House of Lords EU committee has appointed its subcommittee on the protocol in Ireland and Northern Ireland and they held their first meeting on the 28th of April. Uh, the new committee was appointed by the Lords EU Affairs Committee to consider matters relating to the protocol, and that committee is chaired by Lord Jay, and the membership also includes Lord Dodds, Baroness O'Lone and Baroness Ritchie. In respect of the Joint Committee, there have been media reports that the next meeting might be held this month, uh, potentially at the end of the month, where we may see developments in respect of the movement of pets, GBNI, uh, also on the issue of steel, um, but the issue of products of animal origin still remains a very thorny issue um, and it remains to be seen whether we'll see any progress on that particular issue. In relation to the specialised committees that come underneath the Joint Committee then, the um, last meeting of the specialised committee on the protocol was held on the 26th of March. Um, 
and that a meeting was attended by officials from the executive. The UK government described the meeting's atmosphere as constructive and stated that continued progress would require action from the EU as well as the UK. Uh, in its statement, the European Commission recalled the legal action it had initiated against the UK government, and it reminded the UK that checks and controls would be very much reduced if the UK chose to agree to a comprehensive veterinary agreement, i.e. following the EU's SPS rules. The Specialised Committee on Citizens' Rights met at the end of April as well, on the 28th of April, um, and they agreed to meet again in June to produce their fourth report on uh, resident citizens' residence rights. In relation to the Joint Consultative Working Group, then the third of the tiers of uh, governance under the withdrawal agreement, um, it held its second meeting on the 15th of April, and again, executive officials were present at that, and we do expect the, another meeting of that uh, later this month. In relation then, Chair, moving on to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, the European Parliament voted on uh, the 27th of April to ratify the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, and indeed the resolution did uh, include specific reference to the role of the Assembly, including in relation to the democratic consent mechanism to be operated in four years' time, in three years' time now, in 2024. Uh, speaking during the debate, many MPs expressed regret that the uh, TCA agreement doesn't extend security and foreign policy cooperation with the UK, and that the UK will not partic partic participate in the Erasmus Plus scheme. So the European Parliament's decision was then endorsed by the Council on the 29th of April and the TCA then became fully um, applicable on the 1st of May. And obviously, Chair, as you know, there are a number of governance structures under that TCA uh, agreement. Uh, and the UK government had previously said that those structures shouldn't be uh, set up until such time as the agreement was ratified. So now that that ratification has taken place, we can expect maybe some movement on that. And I understand that Mara Shevkovich, um has reached out to Lord David Frost, who will be the co-chair on the uh, will be his co-chair, to set up the Partnership Council, which sits at the top level level of governance of that TCA. But obviously, it remains to be seen whether the devolved governments and the executive will be invited to be part of any UK delegation to that Partnership Council. Um, and obviously, the junior ministers in their previous attendance at your committee did mention that um, they have made representations to that effect. Um, Understand that it's also been reported that the TCA um, partnership um, partnership council may meet this month, so that will be an interesting development if that, if that does take place. Um, then touching on common frameworks, chair, um, there are thirty two common frameworks uh, in total relevant to Northern Ireland. Um, eight of them are now as agreed as provisional frameworks and have moved on to parliamentary scrutiny. And the Hazardous Substances Planning Framework, which the Committee for Infrastructure looked at, has completed its scrutiny process and been finalised. So that's the first framework to reach that final uh, stage. And the other frameworks are all at various stages of development. But the dissolution of the Senate and the Scottish Parliament and their election periods and the reconstitution of their committees has obviously put a stay on parliamentary scrutiny from their side on common frameworks. Uh, and just lastly, on Common Frameworks, then the House of Lords Common Frameworks Scrutiny Committee published its report on the 31st of March um, in relation to the Common Frameworks process and how a collaborative approach should be used as a model to reset UK intergovernmental relations. Um, so that's really the, the paper I wanted to um, quickly run through there, Chair. Happy to take any questions from members or um, even on any other aspects of uh, EU issues they wish to discuss. So thank you very much, Sean. If I come back. Uh, layout and complex uh, issue. Uh, maybe could I just add at the end of, of your report there just to update members that we had a joint uh, meeting today, sir, where we presented to the Eructus Joint uh, Committee, myself and Martina Anderson and Emma Sheeran. Um, it was we were pleased to be able to continue uh, our work with that committee and uh, during it we discussed the importance of maybe having established quarterly meetings with that committee and also about the value of inviting um, Morris Shevkovich to our committee uh, to be able to detail to him some of the concerns and the issues that we have and also about the potential of inviting some of the business leaders uh, at our committee because there was a sense from the discussion today that whilst there are issues and problems, they may not be as big as we're hearing, they may not be as in, as in depth as we're hearing, um, and there may be opportunities as a result of being part 
um, of the new situation. So it's maybe getting those business leaders to give us directly their views without having to go through uh, other prisms. Um, so that was certainly... The, the, uh, is there any members to ask a question? Okay, I think. I think I'm back with you now, am I? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, because I was just having a little break there. Um, okay, is Martina's up in the spotlight there, Martina? Have you a question to ask? Oh, somebody is muted yet, Martina, oh, which is... Fine, fine. Okay. Uh, Shauna and Chair, maybe in relation to these papers, because the value of these papers, uh, we, uh, we have found going from meeting to meeting, keeping us abreast of all that's happening and really updated and informed in the way you collate them and bring them to us. And Chair, just coming out of that meeting this morning, I think this kind of information would be useful to share with the Senate if that's possible. So I'm just wanting to know about the status of this information because, Shona, we're talking about doing perhaps as a committee meeting maybe every quarter and it may be something if it was scheduled right and along with you in your own time frame in advance of that, that we would have a session f with yourself before we even went into that committee. Because I think, Colin, that would have us more informed. And it also, Shauna, that information that you collate for us, I think sharing it with the members of the Senate too, that they would deeply appreciate receiving it as we do. So I'm just looking about the status of the paper and seeing if we can, can we work with the information that we have. Shauna? Yes, Chair. I mean, the, the paper is, is given to the members to do with what they want. So um, it's a committee paper and you can obviously forward it on to who, whoever you wish. Um, I'm very happy, obviously, to liaise with the clerk about future sessions and, and the timing of those in respect of other events or other meetings that the committee's going to. Very happy to do that. Okay, thanks. For that. That's that's a really good idea. Just to get that that in depth briefing before going into then sort of be quizzed or ask questions and, and be able to seek information as well. So that would be very useful. C could I ask Doug Beatty to come up next, there, please? Yeah. Go ahead, Doug. Just, just thank you. And just off, just off the back of that, um, and, and not necessarily for yourself, Sean, although you certainly feed in. Um, I, I get why we all want to speak to the Senate, and I, I'm no issue with that. I don't shy away from it, and I ask the questions of them. And the last time I spoke to the to the Irish Senate, they said to me that the protocol damages a Good Friday Agreement. So uh, I think that was a, was a, was just to highlight exactly the problems that we've got. Have we put any feelers out to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee to see if they would engage with us? Because I just see, to be honest, um, Chair, a slightly one direction uh, approach here. And, you know, I, I just don't see a rounded, fully balanced approach to this to get an idea from, from everybody. Um, and where I'm absolutely happy to take um, information from uh, the Senate or anybody else who wants to, who wants to give information, I do feel that there's also an opportunity to speak to the Northern Ireland on the first committee. Uh, and it would have been great as well if Lord Frost had been invited to engage with us um, yesterday uh, as he engaged with, with others. So is there any chance that when we look at this, uh, we can maybe just balance it up a little bit? Uh, I think there's good information to be had from, from a whole variety of, of, of people. And the papers that Shona uh, is willing to share with the Senate, well, let's share them with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee as well. Thanks for that, Doug. I suppose maybe just in response to it, um, we, we are going to those committees because they've asked to see us. Um, it's not, not the other way around. And as a result of that, that that's developed. But there has been work done uh, with the chairs of the committees in the Assembly, with the chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Um, and those meetings were taking place quarterly as well. And then in terms of Scotland and Wales, that was actually a development that was supposed to fall on the back of that. But I think there's actually, there's been more moves afoot from that. And I'd probably rather get more confirmation uh, on that because there was some questioning about whether 
they, they were useful or not. So I would want to get that confirmed, but very, very happy to, to bring you up to date on where we are with those. But those those meetings were taking place at chairmen of all committees level within Assembly and the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. But the, the committees in, in the Dáil, they, they actually uh, contacted us and asked us to meet them. And it's on the back of those joint meetings that that, that next work plan has come from. So... Um, <laughs> And that's a fair one, and, and I'm not having to go with anybody here, and please don't think I am. But but it, but as it, as it always ends up as a sole unionist talking here, you know, um, and listening here, and 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 it's sometimes having a bit of an echo chamber, you know, um, when everybody's all looking one direction and forgetting to look the other direction. Uh, you know, I really would like a little bit of effort, if where we can, to try and square that circle slightly, because it becomes increasingly difficult for me just to sit and listen to one side say you got this all wrong here's the answer um and then when you dig at something where somebody says well do you know what the the, uh, the northern Ireland protocol damages the Belfast agreement and it does find its way to be made very quiet when when that comes uh, before us um so if we can please chair um uh, and maybe we can work together to be able to do that thanks yeah, absolutely. If I was to be honest, it seems to be that any of the interactions with Westminster seems to be with all the chairs of the committees within the Assembly, uh, because I know, for example, I've met the House of Lords, we've met two committees, one of them twice. So, But they seem to, whenever those meetings happen, it seems to be the chairs of each of the Northern Ireland Assembly committees. But whenever we're doing the interactions with um, Dublin, it's because they have come and asked us as a committee to go to them and then on the back of it, well, let's meet again in three months or maybe it would be useful if we did that. So I'm sure the committee would be more than up for meeting anybody that we can uh, to discuss the issues. So we, we'll definitely take that going forward. Um, I'm going to ask Emma to come up next for a question. Thank you, Chair. I think what Doug has said there I appreciate his, his frustration and obviously his position on this issue has been made clear, but it goes back to what we were talking about this morning at the committee meeting, which I found um, quite interesting and I thought it was a good discussion. We, as an entity, the North was not listened to when it came to Brexit. There are a portion of our population now who are unhappy with the protocol and the implementation of the protocol. But the people that they are ta telling that to are implementing it anyway because it has been found to be the best workable solution to Brexit, a problem not of our making. So we can keep on rehashing that over and over or we can say, right, hold on, how are we going to make this work? Now, I have had constituents hand over fist in the run-up to Brexit contacting me with worries and concerns. I represent a rural constituency. I had lots of farmers on to me, worries about the single farm payment, worrying, uh, worrying about what the replacement will be for, for cap funding and for other rural development funding and the, the streams of money that we've seen from the EU. I haven't had constituents contacting me in any numbers with problems about the protocol. I absolutely think we should engage with the NIA committee and anybody else but the reality is the British government, the British establishment are not interested in the concerns of the people of the North, whether they be loyalist, Republican, other ways or, or none. So what we have to do is work with the people that want to work with us. So I take on board what Doug is saying and I understand his frustration somewhat, but I do think, you know, I, I'm up for engaging with everybody. But at some point you have to just say, look, they're not listening to us. They're not listening to, to Doug and other unionist concerns. And when unionist representation isn't coming to the meetings that we are invited to and we are getting an opportunity to air our concerns, that it makes it very, very difficult. Um, I just would thank Shauna for the presentation. It's, I suppose this is all incredibly complicated and complex and it's taken a long time to work out. But... It, it's good to see that the, the the work is going going and her explainers are useful. So thanks, Shauna. Okay, thank thank you, Emma. Could I ask Trevor Lund to come up next? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Shauna, for your presentation. Um, did 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 you, Shauna, as EU Affairs Manager, or did the appropriate uh, ministers over here actually know that Lord Frost was coming yesterday? 
obviously, Trevor, I can't answer about what the ministers may may or may not have known. Um, yeah. I don't understand. I mean, Lord Frost um, and uh, had said and. and after various meetings, that he would continue engagement on the ground in Northern Ireland. So it wasn't wholly unexpected, but I wasn't aware of the date in advance, if I could put it that way. No, that's okay. Um, do, do, we, do we know, I mean, Doug mentioned this a moment ago, that uh, do we know what organisations he, he met while he was here, apart from the Loyalist Communities Council? That's the only one that was reported. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a statement put out by Lord Frost and the Secretary of State yesterday evening, just on the um, a general statement uh, um, talking about their visit. It didn't give specifics. Um, you may see some some on social media and things and groups that have met them, but there was nothing specific in the press release certainly that was put out by them. I think they must have smuggled them in and smuggled them out again. <laughs> Nobody knew until he was gone. But I'm sorry, I'm not. That's not your concern. You know, I'm, I'm being a wee bit frivolous. <laughs> Thanks very much. No problem. <laughs> All right, Trevor, a little bit of frivolity will get us through every afternoon. That's grand. Uh, if we could ask next, Pat Sheehan, please, to come up and give us a, a question. Thanks, Jar, and thanks, Shauna. Uh, my line dropped off there for a short while, so I may have missed some stuff, so apologize if I'm being repetitive. But And, and maybe this isn't a question for you, Shauna, but sure, you can deal with it anyway. <laughs> uh, a manufacturing NI survey last week indicated that the overwhelming, uh, there was an overwhelming business support for making the protocol work through negotiations uh, and mitigations. What, what can we do to ensure that these stakeholders' views are fed into the Joint Committee? Um, well, obviously the um, executive ministers attend those meetings of, of the Joint Committee, so um, I suppose this committee and any other committee of the assembly really can feed those the feedback they're getting from constituents and stakeholders um, and surveys that are taking place like that one part that you mentioned between tunes and manufacturing and I um, feed those into executive ministers for them to bring uh, to the joint committee because they're part of the UK delegation that attends. Um, I think there's been quite a few surveys. So there's that manufacturing one. And obviously um, in March, we saw the um, Queens are going to be doing quarterly ones uh, through Lucid Talk are carrying out um, and surveys for them. So um, it's sort of an evolving picture um, and there's lots of information out there. The Centre for Cross-Border Studies, for example, has done a, the first of a, a set of surveys they're doing about East, West and North, South cooperation and the effect of Brexit on those. So um, I think it's a very much an evolving picture. So I guess this committee and I'll say any other committee can put forward information to their relevant executive ministers in advance of those joint committee meetings. Um, we do expect there could be one again uh, this month, maybe. So um, you would like to think that that information is already sitting with our executive ministers to bring forward to, to those meetings. But it's nothing to stop any committee sending any information about its respective stakeholders on to, to ministers and ask them to raise that through the joint committee. Okay, thanks for that. That's all I have, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, can I just double check with George Robinson there, George? If you've any questions or anything that you'd like to ask from Shauna, if you can indicate and let us know. Maybe shake the bush behind you there, or or wave at me. No, no. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, well, Sean, I think that's we've reached the, the end from of the questioning. Thank you for, for what you've given us and the information. There's a couple of good uh, outcomes from, from that in terms of where we schedule that, in terms of what's happening maybe the next day or uh, and, and the information, how it'd be helpful and about sharing it with others. And, and I suppose um, to what, one thing I think we have been as a committee is, is we are fairly agreeable. We will generally meet with anybody that asks to meet us or, or, or interact, and I think we will continue to do that. Um, but I suppose the one thing that we can't control is who asks us to meet them. Uh, and, you know, if we're going to meet everybody, um, you know, it's because I, I don't think we've asked to meet too many people. It's really been in reaction to people reaching out to ourselves. But I think we should continue to, to meet anybody because where there's problems identified 
I've always been very clear, talking out the problems is where you find the solutions, which is why I find the approach of just burying your head in the sand totally untenable and really contributes to the problem rather than contributing to, to problem solving. Um, okay, Sean, thank, thank you very much. If we could leave you there, Sean, and bring all the rest of the members up in again, maybe uh, we'll just see if there's any other actions that people want to take um, at the end. I think I saw Martina and Trevor, uh, maybe with the hands indicated there. So, Martina, was there a point you wanted? To, yeah, go on ahead. It's it's picking up on Doug's point, and Doug is vice chair of the committee. You know, you're dealing with people who is willing to talk and confidence and engage with anyone. So, I mean, I've engaged with the House of Lords. If there's people in committees or others that you want us to reach out to, the them is reaching into us, then. I mean, I think for sure, bring bring those suggestions or whatever to the committee and you'll be supported. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point, fair point. Yeah. Um, Trevor? Yeah, well, I was going to suggest that now that Lord Frost has discovered there's easy jet flights to Northern Ireland, that perhaps we could request him to come and meet this committee, which he should have done yesterday anyway. Uh, certainly, there of course, as the radio would say, there are other providers available as well. So uh, yes, but if we want to, we could certainly contact. Uh, if we're going to ask um, Sefcovic to, to Mr. Sefcovic to join us, then maybe we could ask at, a, a, at the same time. We could write and ask Lord Frost to come to us as well. Fair enough. We, we would certainly be able to get some information, so we can do that. Okay. Well, look, members, are we happy enough then to, to, to leave this item of the agenda and we can move on? Um, you'll be pleased to know that because we were so uh, proficient earlier that we uh, are then able to move on to item 10, which is any other business, of which I have none. Is there anybody else that has anything they wish to raise under any other, other business? Then we can move to item 11, which is the date, this time of the next meeting, which will be this day next week at two o'clock by Starleaf. Can I thank members for their attendance and participation today and look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.